The final item of business is members' business debate on motion 15011 in the name of Gordon Lindhurst on remembering the Korean War. And the debate will be concluded without any questions being put. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons? And I call on Gordon Lindhurst to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Deputy Presiding Officer, I am proud to be allowed now to stand here today as a Lothian MSP and lead this debate to remember the Korean War. The motion uh, was originally submitted by me during summer recess to mark 65 years since the signing of the armistice in 1953 that brought an end to the fighting. We now have the opportunity before the end of that 65th year to remember those who fought in the war, including over 230 Scots who paid the ultimate sacrifice a quarter of the British dead. We also recognize the service of the veterans who came home without some of their friends. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome some of them with their friends and family to this chamber today, uh, sitting in the public gallery. They include Major Alan Cameron, former president of the Lothians and West of Scotland Korean Veterans Association, who sits on the Memorial Board of Trustees, Adam McKenzie and Ronnie Wilson, all veterans of the Korean War. Uh, other veterans present are Jock Barr and Jim Bain. Uh, many of them have played a key role in ensuring the Korean War and their fallen comrades are not forgotten. So to all of you, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for the service that you have given to your country. <laughs> Deputy Presiding Officer, 1950s Britain was understandably a country tired of war and threadbare because of it. It was after all less than five years since the end of the Second World War and Korea was either a wholly unknown country or too far away for many to care about. Then Prime Minister Clement Attlee admitted that Korea was distant, yes, but nonetheless an obligation reflecting the UK's membership of the newly formed UN Security Council. That indifference pervaded society, not helped by an inglorious culmination to the war, which saw both sides back to where they started territorially before the war along the 38th parallel. In interviews with BBC's Jackie Bird in 2012, one veteran said of his homecoming, we were only young, we'd start to talk about the war and be told, away lad, that was nothing, I was at Dunkirk. It is why, Deputy Presiding Officer, on both sides of the Atlantic, the conflict is often referred to as the Forgotten War. Yet the stories from it would have reflected the infamous conditions of trench warfare France, sodden and rat infested, a war of attrition and stalemate involving ferocious hill fighting because in Korea, the force controlling the hilltops controlled the country culminating in infamous battles such as that of Hill 235 where the British Army's 29th Infantry Brigade resisted a force that outnumbered them by 18 to 1. All made worse by the fact that the first winter of fighting in Korea was the coldest in a decade, cold that we can hardly even begin to imagine in Western Europe. Indeed, the late George Younger, a platoon commander during the conflict, recalled how the boiling water he used to shave turned to ice before he had finished. The Scottish Korean War Memorial is at Witch Craig in the Bathgate Hills within my own Lothian constituency. It is in fact the only war memorial in the UK devoted solely to those who died in the Korean War. It lists names from across the whole of the UK, not just Scotland. It is in a, a beautiful setting with an historic Korean-style pagoda between two grass mounds arranged like the yin and yang on the Korean flag. The pagoda itself contains the names of around 1,100 British troops who died in the war, represented further by roughly the same number of native Scottish trees and 110 Korean fir trees for every 10 of those soldiers. I would encourage members, if they haven't done so already, to visit and pay their respects if they are able to. Now, it, it can be difficult to locate, but members will be guided by local road signage recently installed by West Lothian Council. Councillors, including Charles Kennedy and Tom Conn, who are also in the chamber today, should be commended for their role in that signage being put up. 
What is disappointing, Deputy Presiding Officer, is that their calls and those of the Board of Trustees, including Major Cameron himself, which have called for trunk road signage to complement that local signage has not been forthcoming. That request made to Transport Scotland has been following instances of those wanting to pay their respects getting lost trying to find it from the M8 and M9, including an incident last year involving a number of Koreans, amongst them the London attaché, who exited the motorway at the wrong junction and spent the next hour trying to find the memorial. Now that is, Deputy Presiding Officer, all the more embarrassing when we consider the efforts of the South Korean government, which it has taken in funding the majority of revisits to Korea by former veterans that have taken place over the years for veterans from this country. And also the warm welcome that they have experienced by an appreciative Korean public, which has broken into spontaneous applause in cities such as Seoul, as metal clad uh, Scottish veterans walk by. Now the Minister and I have corresponded on the issue of signage and I would repeat my calls to him to ensure that appropriate signage is installed. The Scottish Korean War Memorial is not simply a tourist destination in the normal sense. And although it may not reach the 50,000 visitors per year that the usual criteria in respect of signage ask for, it is an important uh, memorial in Scottish and British military history, and that should not be diminished. The costings I have seen appear to me to be excessive in relation to the signage, but I understand that Memorial Trust has offered to pay. And as myself, someone who regularly travels around West Lothian on the M8 and M9, there does not appear to me to be excessive existing signage which would prevent this. So Deputy Presiding Officer, the Korean War may be known as the Forgotten War, but there are clearly steps we can take to mitigate that perception. What better year to do so than in the 65th year since the signing of the armistice? We move to the open debate and speeches of around four minutes, please. Uh, Kenneth Gibson, followed by Elaine Smith. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to contribute to today's Act of Remembrance, and I congratulate Gordon Lyndhurst on securing this debate and providing all of us with a chance to keep the memory of the Korean War alive. A war that is often forgotten, as Gordon has said, yet brought more British deaths than any other post-World War II conflict, and I welcome uh, the veterans of the Korean War to the gallery. When war broke out in 1950, Scotland and Britain were still recovering from World War II. By necessity, the fighting force in Korea was mostly made up of young national servicemen, the majority of whom were teenagers, many of whom had never left their hometowns before. And it's hard to imagine being sent to a far off Asian peninsula at such a young age with such meagre life experience, but that for many was the reality. With just 16 weeks training, these young soldiers faced gruelling ordeals, including ferocious hill battles, trench warfare, and attacking human waves of the well-drilled Korean People's Army, backed with tanks, artillery, and aircraft supplied by the Soviet Union and China. Of 14,198 British soldiers who served with the United Nations forces, 1,114 lost their lives, including 236 Scots. UK forces suffered total losses of 4,502, including missing, wounded and captured. Almost a third of the entire contingent became casualties in one way or another. It's right, therefore, that we pay tribute to those men who lost their lives, as well as those maimed or who endured the nightmare of a North Korean prison camp. Scottish soldiers made up nearly a quarter of the dead, and it seems that Scotland's casualties have long been disproportionate in conflicts from the Napoleonic Wars onwards, evident with the names of the 134,712 men and women projected onto this building on 11th of November. Those lucky enough to return from Korea did not receive a hero's welcome. Veterans report that after experiencing the horrors of war and the brutal cold of a Korean winter and the searing summer heat, those young fighters returned home to a Britain that simply didn't want to know. While well, Scotland may not have recognised the courage and sacrifice of these young men, in South Korea, the United Nations who fought in the war are considered heroes, as Gordon uh, Lyndhurst has mentioned. The South Korean government even helps fund revisit programmes, allowing veterans to pay tribute to fallen comrades buried in the Commonwealth Cemetery in Busan. Scottish veterans revisit in Korea dressed in regimental blazers, military berries and with well-polished medals were met with bows 
and applause in recognition of their role in saving South Korea from the Stalinism which still grips the North. I'm heartened that the, uh, the Scottish Korean War Memorial has duly commemorated the sacrifice of each of the British soldiers who lost their lives. The 1114 native Scottish trees and the shrine sounded, uh, surrounded by a landscape indicative of yin and yang provides a fitting setting for a place of remembrance. In July this year, Ayrshire veterans visited the site and were moved by its serenity and symbolic significance. I support Mr Linhurst's calls to ensure the site is accessible to all, not only so that veterans can recall this chapter of their lives and pay tribute to fallen friends, but so visitors, young and old, can understand the significance of this forgotten war and the tragedy of young lives lost. We must not allow the Korean War to simply be a footnote in Scotland's public consciousness. While people at home may not have felt involved in a war with no real victor, this conflict is intrinsically linked to international relations today. To understand the harrowing reality of human rights abuses, enslavement and imprisonment of North Korean citizens, we must first understand the history of the region and our part in it. Presiding officer, while it's often easier to look away and forget, to do so would be to fail people who lost their lives in the conflict and those relying now on the international community to recognise the scale of the abhorrent situation in North Korea. In 2018, as we commemorate the 65th anniversary of the signing of the armistice, on 27 July 19, 1953, we also witnessed some modest steps forward in the painfully slow Korean peace process. While there is still much to be done, I hope the armistice will eventually be replaced with a comprehensive and permanent peace treaty to officially end the Korean War that we commemorate today. Elaine Smith, followed by Maurice Corey. Thank you very much, President Officer, and I thank Gordon Linders for bringing forward this interesting debate this evening um, to commemorate the armistice. I have to admit my knowledge of the Korean War is somewhat limited, but I'm sure this will be the case for many people since the Korean War is indeed known as the Forgotten War, as noted by the two previous members. Um, the main information, President Officer, that I had came from MASH, the satirical American television show about a mobile army surgical hospital during the Korean War. I actually spent some time with family friends who lived in Canada when I was 17 and much of my time then was filled by watching um, back to back episodes of MASH on the novelty of multi channels. We had only four in the UK at that time. And although that dark comedy drama was fictional, depicting a group of doctors and nurses who served as the fictional 4077th Mobile Army Surgical Hospital during the Korean War, it did expose some of the horrors of the war um, and often used satire to do so. This was undoubtedly because it was semi-autobiographical as it was based on the 1968 novel by Richard Hooker um, entitled MASH, a novel about three army doctors. The book was based on Richard Hooker's own experiences as a surgeon in the 8055th MASH in South Korea, and the main character, Army Doctor Hawkeye Pierce, is based on the author. However, I really had no knowledge of the thousands of UK service personnel who fought and died in that war, and I had no idea that there was a memorial in West Lothian, which I'm certainly now keen to see for myself. The war itself was part of the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States, with Korea split into two sovereign states and both governments claiming to be the sole legitimate government of all Korea and neither accepted the border as permanent. The conflict, of course, escalated into open warfare when North Korean forces, supported by the Soviet Union and China, moved into the South on the 25th of June 1950. The UN Security Council authorised the formation and dispatch of UN forces to South Korea to repel the North Korean invasion and 21 countries of the United Nations eventually contributed to the UN force, with the United States providing around 90% of the military personnel. The UN force included um, those service personnel from three Scottish regiments as recognised tonight. And I was quite um, harrowed to read that the youngest soldiers waited, went out and waited in Hong Kong or Japan until they were 19 and considered old enough to go into battle. So I'm pleased that Gordon Lindhurst has raised the profile of the Memorial in West Lothian. Um, the Lothians in West Scotland branch of the British Korean Veterans Association, supported by the local authority, created the memorial, I think, nearly 18 years ago, but it isn't well known. Therefore, I think it would be helpful if veterans and visitors could have improved signage on their motorways to help them locate the memorial, not least myself, if I'm going to go visit, that would be helpful. Um, and the development of a wider education programme would also be welcome, building on the excellent work that's been done so far in West Lothian. 
Educating our young people about the reality of war and the sacrifice of those who were injured and died is so important. Education about the horrors of war takes many forms, be that in the classroom or in our museums and galleries or through satirical dramas like MASH. In 1945, with millions of lives lost in two world wars, 51 countries signed up to the UN Charter of the United Nations, providing a framework for international cooperation, dialogue and discussion to provide solutions to international social and economic problems rather than conflict. President officer, tonight's members debate, I think, has given us a chance to reflect on the impact of war in families and communities who have lost their loved ones. And we know that those who have seen war and suffered its effects think more should be done to avoid it. Revisiting our history, remembering forgotten wars and adhering to international treaties and agreements that respect human rights and freedoms is vital if we are to work together to build a world free of wars and conflicts. Once again, I thank Gordon Lindhurst for bringing the debate. And the last of the open debate contributions is from Maurice Corey. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It is indeed a privilege to speak this afternoon, and I thank my colleague Gordon Lindhurst for bringing forward this member's business. I am delighted to welcome veterans here today in the public gallery, and in particular, Jock Barr and Jim Bain, my fellow Argyles. With this year being the 100th anniversary of the First World War Armistice, hundreds of thousands took part in active remembrance and commemorations. But this year also saw another anniversary, one which lacks the same coverage and awareness, the Korean War, otherwise sadly known as the Forgotten War, as Gordon Lind has already stated. As a veteran myself, I am keenly aware of how important it is to remember the sacrifice of those who have fallen in war. The Korean War, just as every other conflict, deserves to be remembered, as do our British soldiers who fought in it. The Cold War left Korea a split nation, with worsening tensions between both sides, and in response to North Korea's invasion of the South in 1950, the UN commenced its first act of military operations. Indeed, over 21 countries from around the world joined forces in a UN coalition, Britain also played its part and had its part to play in that, and this was not insignificant. Not even a decade had passed after the Second World War, and yet almost 100,000 Britons committed themselves to fighting in yet another conflict, one that is separate and distant from their own country. Many were young men and had no idea of what they were involving themselves in. And along with other Scottish regiments and my own, the Argyll and Southern Highlanders joined for these forces. In 1953, Fighting came to an end, and with an armistice signed and a demilitarized zone created as a result. Territorially, the end result proved no different from the beginning for both nations. Over 1,100 British lives were lost, and over 230 of these men were Scottish, as mentioned already by a previous speaker. Their bravery should not be forgotten. Yet upon their return, many British soldiers felt their communities indifferent to their sacrifice. Some were made to feel their fighting in the Korean War was inferior to the sacrifices made in the Second World War. Their cost and commitment was not given the validation they needed. Perhaps this is due to there being no clear victory, or perhaps the nation had just emerged from the horrors which they had wished not to endure again. But for whatever reason, we need to make sure that we also count the cost of those who fought and died in the Korean War. And the, there are memorials scattered across Scotland and the wider UK in remembrance of soldiers lost in two world wars. Edinburgh alone has 37. In Scotland, there is just one memorial to remember the particular cost of the Korean War. The Scottish Korean War Memorial can be found tucked away in the Bathgate Hills in West Lothian. It is designed to create a space of peace, a, pay, a, a space to reflect. Surrounding the memorial, our Korean firs and over 1,000 native Scottish trees, which stand as a collective reminder of lives lost. A traditional pagoda lists the names of those who did not return home, and this tribute marks the bravery and admiration that are owed to veterans of this conflict. And their experiences and, uh, and casualties from this war are worth no less than any other. It shows a connection we are proud of to share with South Korea, one that should not be ignored. Creating awareness of this project is key, and I congratulate the efforts made to do this. For instance, the 2008 project, West Lothian and Forgotten War, described what life was truly like as a Scottish soldier fighting in Korea. It brought individuals to the fore who endured injury and captivity. Projects such as this, just, as, uh, just like the South, uh, Scottish Korean War Memorial, emphasize the reality of this conflict and give it the detail and nuance it deserves. To conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, this memorial serves to encourage not just our remembrance, but our appreciation of the link Scotland has with South Korea. 
I support the calls for greater signage in order to clearly direct visitors to this special place. And with its 65th anniversary year now, I hope for greater awareness and understanding. For only with this can we have true gratitude for those who fought in the Korean War. Thank you. Now ask the Minister to conclude the debate. Um, around seven minutes, please, Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me begin by uh, thanking Gordon Lindhouse for securing an opportunity to highlight the Korean War and for his uh, scene-setting opening speech. Uh, as we've heard again tonight, the support for our veterans in this chamber is cross-party. We remember the hardships endured, the courage displayed in the face of adversity and the ultimate sacrifice made by many. Signal, officer, over the past four years, we've been commemorating the many centenaries uh, linked to the Great War. But whilst this has focused attention on one specific major conflict, I think it has more generally raised awareness of others and recognised the dedication and determination of previous generations. It's important that we continue to remember those who served and lost their lives in all conflicts, not to glorify war, but to recognise the sacrifice made in many cases to protect the freedoms that we enjoy today. And tonight's debate has helped us do just that. Uh, let me thank members for their contributions and perhaps explain to the veterans in the gallery that um, my ministerial colleague Fiona Hislop would have added her uh, voice to those contributions, um, but for the fact that as a minister she's prevented from doing so. Um, as we've heard, uh, 2018 marks the 65th anniversary of the Korean War, or the, the conclusion of the Korean War, a brutal conflict where many lives were lost as we've heard, approximately 1,100 UK lives, uh, of which 236 were Scots. As we've also heard, in June 1950, just as the UK was rebuilding, regenerating and recovering from World War II, and still subject to rationing, many families were plunged yet again into the uncertainty and worry of loved ones fighting overseas. Some who had survived the Second World War a very short time before and thought never again to be involved in such conflicts were recalled for service in Korea. You can only imagine how some of those must have felt. Three Scottish regiments served in Korea, the Argyll and Southern Highlanders, the King's Own Scottish Borderers, and the Black Watch. And we should recognise, as Kenny Gibson did, that many combatants were very young national servicemen. The uh, Korean conflict has been labelled the Forgotten War by some, but for many, certainly in the service community, it's a conflict recognised just as much as others. At last month's National Remembrance event uh, held in Dundee's Keir Hall, which I attended as the Veterans Minister, veterans of the Korean War were rightly afforded their place. And with the Black Watch, with its near 300-year history, Korea is up there with the other conflicts it has served in. I visited the Black Watch Museum in Perth on Monday, and whilst there I noted a number of references to the regiment's involvement in Korea, including a photograph of the 1st Battalion Black Watch being inspected by the Queen Mother before they embarked for the East. So let me commend the efforts of all concerned in making sure the Korean War receives wider recognition as remembered by the current generation, and in particular acknowledge the two-year education project West Lothian and the Forgotten War, which involved both veterans and local school children in developing educational material and raising awareness of the conflict. It is essential that our young people today continue to be able to understand these parts of our history for young people to learn directly from veterans of the conflict, many of whom would have been in their late teens in the 1950s. It's a unique experience, the significance of which should not be underestimated. Let me also recognise the Scottish Korean War Memorial Trust, Major Alan Cameron and his predecessor, the late Lieutenant Colonel Johnny Johnston, West Lothian Council, and previously the work of the Lothians and West of Scotland branch of the British K Korean Veterans Association in establishing, promoting and maintaining the Scottish Korean War Memorial in the Bathgate Hills. All Scottish war dead are commemorated in the Scottish National War Memorial, including those Scots servicemen who served in the Korean War. But it's also fitting that such a striking memorial, a Korean-style wood and slate-crafted pagoda, to, uh, to all of those who fought in Korea is cited in Scotland. And the unique nature of this commemoration is, of course, emphasised by the inclusion of the trees around the site to represent the total UK personnel killed in that war. Presiding officer, I'm of course well aware of the Korean War Memorial Trust's ask for improved signage to the site, which has been noted by a number of members tonight. As we've heard, Transport Scotland has been involved in discussions with the Trust around signs on the M8 and M9, 
and have, been ass have assessed the application for signing in line with tourist signage policy. Members will appreciate that there needs to be a national policy in place for signs to ensure consistency and suitability of tourist signage on the trunk road network. In particular, the M8 and the M9 motorways are high-speed routes carrying large volumes of traffic. It is therefore necessary to ensure that signage is limited only to that which is essential to the continued safe operation of the routes. Unfortunately, the Korean War Memorial does not meet the strict eligibility criteria, which is why it has not been considered appropriate to sign from the M8 and M9 motorways in this case. This is particularly due to the criteria around visitor numbers to the site. However, I am pleased that West Lothian Council has installed brown tourist signs directing visitors to the Korean War Memorial from its local... Yes? Elaine Smith. Thanks, President Officer. I just want to clarify with the Minister that um, he said he talked about member numbers. So I just want to clarify that because there's not enough member, uh, sorry, there's not enough visitor numbers, the signage can't go up. But obviously, that's a chicken and egg situation because if there was signage, then maybe there would be more visitors to the memorial. Graham Day. I think there's an issue around about. I accept the point that the member makes, um, and, I, and I'll perhaps deal with this in, in, as a close. Um, as I said, I am pleased that West Lothian Council has installed the brown suit tourist signs um, uh, on their net, uh, roads network. And these signs were erected earlier this year and I, and I hope are now enabling improved visibility and access to this important memorial. In addition to this, I have asked Transport Scotland to make contact with West Lothian Council to explore what opportunities exist to improve the travel information provided in the memorial's online page. However, presiding officer, I have also listened to the views that are held on the issue of signage, along with representations from my colleague Fiona Hislop, in whose constituency the memorial stands. And as a consequence, I have entered into discussions with the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity. As a result of those discussions, we will be tasking Transport Scotland with scoping a potential review of its signage policy as that pertains to war memorials of national significance, such as this one. I would stress that should it proceed, it would only look at war memorials of national significance and any changes made would have to be consistent with the other wider requirements of such signage. However, I hope this commitment will be seen for what it is, a demonstration of the respect this government holds for its veterans community and a genuine willingness to explore whether we can address concerns around signage in relation to the Korean War Memorial. Presiding officer. That concludes the debate and this meeting is closed.